the epic casebook. In which Inspector Carr investigates. Good evening. I remember when I was a young sergeant, keeping more regular hours than I did when I became an inspector, wondering about a shriveled old lady I used to see walking down Vine Street during the winter months. As she would clutch her faded finery against the cold wind, a single ostrich feather would droop from a ridiculous little hat kept on top of her head by means of a hat pin. It seemed intent on tickling her nostril, and now and again she would make abortive efforts to push the feather back in its place. Her shoes were cracked and down at heel, and her hands, blue with cold, would clutch at a shawl that had seen better days. Being young, I began to conjure up fanciful pictures about her. A poor, lonely old woman making for the nearest public house in order to purchase a few coppers worth of cheap red biddy. Every weeknight, as I emerged from the police station promptly at six, from November through to the end of January, she would be walking towards me. My curiosity became so great that I wanted to speak to her or press a ten-shilling note into her palm. Luckily, I desisted. One day, I saw a picture of her in the newspaper. It told of her death and funeral, attended by over 900 scientists and research workers from all over the world. She was Professor Mary Sharpleton, and her research and books in the field of genetics is still required reading. She used to come to London to attend the Royal Society lectures during its winter term. A woman oblivious of self, dedicated to the cause of humanity. Ever since then, I've marveled at the devotion and single-mindedness of scientists and sociologists. I mention this because my story tonight concerns the murder of Professor Gustav Schultz. I've called my story The Antithesis of Life. At the time he met his death, Professor Schultz was reading a paper at the Royal Society on the relationship between ancient taboos and modern biochemical developments. And so it will be seen that when Freud wrote his book Totems and Taboos, he was so preoccupied with the id and the subconscious that he failed to take into consideration the ever-changing chemical structures within the human psyche. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. Oh, uh, me here, let me do it for you, Professor. Yeah, we yeah. are. should. <coughs> Good heavens, the Professor seems to have suffered a heart attack. But it was not a heart attack in the accepted medical sense. His heart gave out all right. Professor Schultz died from swallowing a lethal dose of poison. Professor Wilson, who presided over the proceedings, realized what had happened almost immediately. He communicated with the police. His was the solitary figure as I arrived at the hall. Inspector Carr, Scotland Yard. Oh, thank goodness you're here. I didn't know what to do for the best. Poor Schultz. I decided to send everyone back to their place of residence. There are 75 delegates attending this Congress, most of them from overseas. I did not convey to them my suspicions that Professor Schultz had been murdered. I thought it prudent to be equivocal. Now please, please, gentlemen, do not come forward. As you can see, Professor Schultz has been taken seriously ill. Now, there are only five more pages to his thesis. Copies of his paper will be distributed to you all at tomorrow morning session. <laughs> Professor Marchbanks, would you please give me a hand? As 
You see, Professor Schultz is slightly built. Marchbanks and I had no difficulty in carrying his body to the antechamber. And according to the statement you gave over the telephone, you say that this gentleman sipped at a glass of water and slumped forward. There were immediate symptoms that the water contained poison? Oh, no question about it, as you'll see when you look at the body. It was fortunate that the platform is some eight feet away from the first row of seats. Why fortunate, Professor? The delegates could not see Phil Schultz's face as he slumped forward. It, it might have caused some sort of panic. Oh. Certainly the fact that a murder has been committed at the Royal Society and that the victim was the eminent Professor Gustav Schultz would have been broadcast all over the world. If you're correct in your diagnosis, and I would not question it for one second, Professor Wilson, the Society is in for a spate of publicity. I mean, it isn't often that murder... Oh, that's occurs. just it, Inspector. Does the news of the murder have to leak out? These things can never be kept secret. Professor Marchbanks is at this very moment telephoning Germany, notifying Frau Schultz that her husband has collapsed and died. If we can keep it from the public until we've found out how the poison got into that glass, I'd be grateful. Well, I can understand your concern for the good name of the society and that the dignified proceedings of your Congress should not be unduly disturbed. Good heavens, it isn't that, Inspector. Just that as president of the Royal Society and at the same time as your most obvious suspect... Oh, just a minute. Why do you say my most obvious suspect? Well, I've told you. I was the one that poured that water from the jug into the glass and handed it to him. Frankly, I'm concerned for the dignity and reputation of the Royal Society and, more selfishly, my own position. I've heard of your work, Inspector, and I'm hoping and praying that before news of this murder leaks out, you'll have apprehended the monster who caused Professor Schultz's death. That's why I asked everyone to leave, including the caretaker. Mm -hmm. I take it you've examined the jug and the glass containing the poison? Yes, Inspector, if you'll come with me. Wilson and I left the Congress Hall and walked towards the antechamber. Coming towards us was a short, rotund, middle-aged man in his early fifties. He was as unlike a scientist as one could possibly imagine. Yet it was the famous Professor Marchbanks, responsible for the Marchbanks theory into the materialist conception of medical history. I've broken the news to Frau Schultz. She wanted to know the cause of her husband's death. I evaded a direct answer by saying that we wouldn't know until the autopsy had been held. Are you from the police, sir? Uh, this is Inspector Carr, uh, Professor Marsh. Oh, how do you do, Inspector? Mm, terrible business. To happen here, of all places. How do you know, Professor? I'm um, about to show the Inspector the body. What a terrible word. Now, what have you done with the jug and the glass? I placed them in the anteroom, knowing how vital they'll be to your inquiries. Have you told the inspector about the slight contretemps over the agenda? No, I was about to. Mm -hmm. What was that? Well, Marchbanks and I were responsible for drawing up the agenda. There was a cocktail party last night, a traditional event on the eve of our annual congress. Ah, Professor Wilson. May I have a word with you, please? Uh, good afternoon, Professor Marshbanks. Oh, good evening, Professor Schultz. Oh, I certainly, but will you excuse No, 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 no. It concerns Professor Marshbanks. You two constitute, uh, how you say, the, the steering committee, no? Uh, yes, Professor. Oh, by the way, how do you find your hotel? Adequate? Let us not indulge in trivialities. I see that you have down here uh, Professor Henderson to speak at 9 o'clock, and I will read my paper at 11 after the tea recess, no? Yes, that's right. Marchbanks and I thought... No. Uh, but why? Have you not read his critique of my book? The man is a charlatan. He claims to a scholarship he does not possess. Only in this country could Henderson become professor. They reprinted his article in Der Spiegel. Now, in my country, I was made... Before you go on, Professor Schultz, Norman Henderson happens to be my son-in-law. There's no more gifted man in his field. If you're questioning either his integrity or his qualification... If he speaks fast, it means we are both on the platform together tomorrow evening. I mean, uh, tomorrow morning. Now, this I will not tolerate. I've already written to the association expressing my disgust at, at such cheap scientific journalism. Now, look here. Henderson's not only Wilson's son-in-law. He's a dear friend of mine. And I'm not going to stand here listening oh, to you running... on much, Banks. You're all right, Professor Schultz. I don't want the Congress to start on an acrimonious note. I'll get a new agenda runoff. You may read your paper first thing tomorrow morning. 
expected this morning to have a slightly charged atmosphere. I wasn't prepared for what did happen, though. I'm sure you weren't. Oh, should we go in? Yes, certainly. It's just here. I took the precaution of locking the door just in case the murderer was still lurking in the building. I cannot pretend that I find the Herr Professor a man of endearing charm, but to have this happen to him. The antechamber was a sort of study come reference library. The walls completely covered in books of heavy binding. Obviously, learned tomes ready to be used by members of the society requiring items for reference. Sprawling in a large armchair was the lifeless body of the German delegate. It did not require any training in medicine to appreciate the fact that he'd been poisoned. The blue tinge around his lips and nostrils, the slight bubbles of froth at each end of his mouth told the tale all too clearly. On a small table near the body was a half-filled jug and a glass containing a minute amount of liquid. I assume the glass fell from his hand as he collapsed. Yes, Inspector, but there remained sufficient liquid for laboratory analysis. Good. And the jug? If you say that you poured the water from the now, just jug... Just a minute, Inspector. Smell this jug. Huh? Hmm. There's no smell of almonds or any other kind of acid. Now, smell this glass. Mm-hmm. It's not almonds. Extraordinary smell. It's almost like stale cabbage. Yes, Inspector Carr. That's how we describe the smell of parasite. It's ten times deadlier than cyanide. Now, do you see why I'm apprehensive for my reputation? Honestly, Wilson, no one's going to. Uh, just you a minute, sir. Tell me about the parasite. Well, it was discovered during the early part of the war. Professor Coble at Oxford discovered that, uh, given the right amount of humidity, one could produce from the fungus an acid which, when mixed with a certain agent, produced what we now know as parasite. It was used to poison wells by our special agents acting behind the lines. <laughs> Many a poor blighter swallowed the capsule rather than fall into the hands of the Gestapo. You say that the professor was giving his lecture, paused to get a drink of water. Oh, but you did it for him. Hmm? You picked up the jug and the glass, poured the water into the glass. It must have contained a minute spot of parasite. You didn't see it. Inspector, except for its smell, which one would hardly notice in the midst of a lecture, a parasite is completely colorless. Uh... And so the $64 question is, who put the parasite in the glass, when, and why? There was little more I could do at the august building that housed the Royal Society. Having arranged for the corpse to be removed to the police mortuary so that our own surgeons could examine it, and the jug and glass to be sent to our forensic laboratories, I returned to Scotland Yard. By then, it was almost lunchtime, with the midday racing editions containing news of Schultz's death. Read all about it. Royal Society delegate drops dead. Sudden death of German professor. Read all about it. Here. Yeah. Oh, hello, Inspector. Hello. Some professor collapses, you'd think all these scientists would know how to live forever, wouldn't you? A problem that has escaped man since time immemorial. Blimey, oh, Inspector, you are being a bit... Royal Society, yes, would you say? It does get infections. Well, what's that, infections? Oh, never mind, I, I'm thinking of poison. Inspector, you want to know who manufactures parricide and where? That's right, Ops. I get through to X branch. All right, sir. Schultz lived at Stuttgart. Get through to the commandant there. We'd be grateful for any discreet inquiries he could make. Any enemies, that sort of thing. Right, sir. I also want to know from immigration how often Professor Schultz visited the United Kingdom, whether the immigration form gives references. In fact, I want as clear a picture as I can possibly get of Schultz's activities and contacts over the last ten years. Right, sir. My compliments to X Branch. If they don't come up with something pretty soon, it means getting to work on the background of 75 eminent scientists from 48 different countries. Blimey. 
sir. Say that again. Get weaving. Very good, sir. Yes, oh, uh, are you Mr. Matthews? Uh, yes, sir. that's right, sir. Uh, you, you wanted to see me? Yes, do come in. Sit down. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Don't be nervous. No one's going to eat you. Uh, you've heard that one of the speakers died this morning? Uh, yes, yes, I did, sir. And your uh, caretaker uh, come staff superintendent, aren't you? Yes, sir, that's right. I, I say to it that the cleaners do their work properly. The attendants are right now, and when the Royal Society is open for lectures, you know, that sort of thing, sir. I gather. Now, Mr. Matthews, your evidence is vitally important. Uh, well, I can understand that, sir. Uh, poor bloke being murdered away from his home. Frankly, I'm trying to crack this case before the press get hold of the full facts. An incident like this can create all sorts of international frictions. Now, someone put poison in that glass. What I want from you is a complete timetable. When the glasses are taken from their storage place, who washes them? Who got hold of the jug, the lot? I see, sir, yes. Oh, better well, I can... still, I think I'd better go over there and I'd like you to get the staff on parade. I want everyone to go through the motions of their activities this morning. Where were they? How far away were they from the Congress Hall? And most important of all, who handled the glass and the jug? Very good, sir. Uh, listen to me, everyone. Quiet, please. Now, you know that a guest of the Royal Society collapsed and died suddenly some hours ago. We had hoped to confine our investigations within circumscribed limits so that it is not common knowledge that foul play is suspected. It is. Vital to my investigation is the knowledge of what you were all doing when this tragic incident occurred. I want to know also who handled the jug and the glass that were placed on the platform table. And so, urged on by Matthews, the staff mined their actions earlier that day. It seemed that one man handled the glass containing the deadly poison. Now you say, Buckley, that you took the glass and the jug from that cupboard, walked over to the sink, washed and dried them, half-filled the jug with water, placed it on that silver tray, carried it to the Congress Hall, and placed it on the table. Is that right? Yes, sir, that's right. And you say that you're sure that the tray was placed on the table at a quarter to nine? I'm sure of it, sir, yes. You see, I was due to start cleaning the West Wing at nine o'clock, and I looked at my watch and said, Blimey, I'd better get a move on if I want a cup of char first. And you never came back to the Congress Hall? No, sir, I never. Thank you. Sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Matthews. I think that's about all. I must check these timetables against the times given me by the President. You say, Professor Wilson, that the Congress commenced at nine o'clock? Yes, that is so. I'm now convinced that the glass was tampered with at the Congress Hall. Who was the first to arrive at the hall? Well, let me see. Uh, I was... Oh, no, no. Marchbanks. He was already on the platform when I got there. What time did you get there? I'd say about five to nine. Did you touch the glass or the jug at all before you opened the proceedings, I mean? No, I just made sure it was there. I didn't want another altercation with the worthy professor. What do you mean? Oh, he was rather Teutonic in his reminder at the cocktail party. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen, Professor Wilson. Here's your coat, sir. Ah, uh, danke schön. Uh, good night, Professor. We'll see you in the morning. Ah, uh, yeah, my lecture. Uh, the condition of my mouth when I speak it gets very dry. Uh, please make sure there is fresh water. My dear Professor, there's always fresh water on the conference table. Is there not, Matthews? Always, sir. I see. And you say that Professor Marchbanks was already at the hall when you arrived? Yes, he was. Oh, uh, Mr. President, uh, don't you think we ought to... Sorry, Inspector. Oh, no, not a bit. Uh, just the man I wanted to see, Professor Marchbanks. The President tells me that you were the first to arrive at the conference. Yes, I was. You saw the jug of water and glass on the table? Yes, I did. Did you touch the glass? Yeah, I'm afraid so. I moved a little further towards the center. Handier for the speaker. I took it off the tray. I see. I'm sorry, but then I... it must have been yours. There are three distinct fingerprints, and one rather smudged. That makes four in all. Buckley, who put the tray there. Yourself, who moved the glass. 
Professor Wilson, who picked up both glass and drug to pour the water, and of course the unfortunate Schultz who drank from the glass. So that makes four suspects. One didn't have to handle the glass to doctor it. Thank you, gentlemen. I trust that neither of you will be leaving London for the time being. I'm almost certain to want to question you again. Carp? Operations here, Inspector. Yes? Uh, rather negative about the late Professor Schultz, sir. Oh? Uh? He hasn't visited this country for 12 years. Stayed at Trumpington near Cambridge while he was attending a course at Queen's College. Mm, that's not going to help as much, is it? Well, I'll be... Uh, beg your pardon, sir. I'm sorry, Ops. I was indulging in a little self-castigation. I'm a blind, stupid nitwit. Oh, well, sir... Uh, you'd better not say anything, or I'll have you up before the disciplinary board. Matthews. Peter Matthews, employed by the Royal Society. I want to know everything and anything about him and as quickly as you can. Uh, very good, sir. It had to be. There was no other reasonable explanation. For the rest of the day, I went through the motions, pursuing my investigation, checking on all the delegates, the staff, receiving reports from X-Branch. Yet deep down in my heart was the knowledge that the answer to the mystery of who killed Professor Gustav Schultz could be supplied by one man. Well? Uh, Peter Matthews. That's the man. Uh, what do you say, sir? I'm sorry. Well, what have you got? Uh, Peter Matthews, employed before the war as a trainee scaffolding engineer, conscripted in the army in 1941, taken prisoner in 1943, released by American forces in 1945. Not enough, Ops, not half enough. Where did he serve in the army? Where was he taken prisoner? And by the same token, where was Professor Schultz during those years? Because I want motive, man, motive. It had to be. It was beyond all credence that men such as Professors Marshbanks and Wilson would plot and execute a murder in the august precincts of the Royal Society. It had to be Matthews. It was. Carp. Uh, I'll get in now, sir. Come on, up with the ops. What have you got? Uh, Peter Matthews, posted to the Rifle Brigade, March the 4th, 1941. Yes. Transferred to special services on January the 10th, 1943. Mm. Worked behind the enemy lines. Was captured in October the same year. And Schultz? Uh, uh, Matthews was a prisoner in the Frowley camp where the commandant was Schultz. That's it. That ties it up. Thank you, ops. Tell X branch they've done a good job. Ah, Professor Wilson. Tell me, Professor, what do you know about Matthews? Matthews? I wasn't president in those days, of course, but I was on the appointments committee. Uh, the authorities had difficulty in finding situations for some of our poor lads who had been tortured during their imprisonment. I remember when I first met Matthews, a youth with the face of an old man. He had been trained to work in structural engineering. After his experiences in Froelig, uh, there was little he could do other than what he's doing now. But surely you don't suspect... It's more than suspicion, Professor. It's fact. But you know what that man went through? He went through the agonies of hell and never once betrayed the whereabouts of his comrades. You know he was decorated by the king. His torturer was Schultz. If he didn't do the actual torturing, he was in command. There's no point in denying it, is there, Inspector? You figured it all out, chapter and verse. All those years I kept that poison, a capsule a third of an inch long and a sixth of an inch wide, and I knew that one day that that powder side would help me settle a score with that swine. Matthews, I'm sorry for you, but you've no right to take the law into your own hands. I'm arresting you for the premeditation. All right, murder. Inspector. You needn't finish it. I plead guilty. <laughs> what is there for me to live for anyway? When they got me back to Blighty, they, they told me I couldn't hope to live the life of any normal man, you know, have a wife and kids and... Matthews, is there anyone you'd like me to telephone? Anything I can get you before I take you down to the cells? Would you please just tell Professor Wilson I'm sorry and I wouldn't have let anyone else be charged. I really wouldn't have, Inspector. I'm convinced of that, old chap. You, you got on to me pretty quickly. You helped me. Me? Oh. Well, you see, Matthews... Well, listeners, how did Matthews give himself away? Not sure?
well, listeners, what was it that pointed to Matthews as the culprit? Simple, really. If you remember, there was a complete conspiracy of silence between myself and the two professors. No one else knew that the man had been murdered. And yet Matthews said to me, Poor bloke, being murdered away from his home. How did he know unless he was the murderer? That statement coupled with... Here's your coat, sir. Don't get sure. Uh, good night, Professor. See you in the morning. Ah, uh, yeah, my lecture. It's the condition of my mouth when I speak. It gets very dry. Please make sure there is fresh water. As soon as Matthews set eyes on the commandant of the camp who failed to recognize him, he was determined on revenge. They made his life as comfortable as they could in prison, but the ill health that dogged him took its toll, and he died in prison hospital. And the moral of the story, if you're a member of the Gestapo, don't go torturing your prisoner. He'll only get acid. Good night. The Epic Casebook was produced by Michael Silver with Hugh Russ as Inspector Carr. Listen again next Thursday night at 9.30 to another exciting story from our Epic Casebook. <laughs> <laughs>